Welcome back to my Higurashi Timeline series, where in each episode we will go over every single available arc of the series when they happened, forming the ultimate Higurashi Timeline. This involves the manga arcs, the console arcs, the anime arcs, and the visual novel arcs. As I said in my last video, I plan to release one of these videos per month, so here we are for part 2. I would like to note that these videos are in no way a replacement for the actual Higurashi series. If you want to support the Higurashi manga, visual novels, or anime, there will be links in the description below. In my last video, I set a precedent towards the end of the video that was solidified by a group vote in my public discord server, which is that we will be going by arcs for the timeline. Which, by the way, you should totally join that discord server link below. Anyways, this is important because half of the last arc of the series, Matsuri Bayashi Hen, has the backstory of the character Mio Takano. This would chronologically go next in our timeline, but because we're going by arcs, this will happen and be covered much later on down the line, since only half of the arc takes place before the Higurashi looping begins. In terms of this video, chronologically, the next arc would be a manga called Oni, which takes place in 1923. This currently manga-only arc covers the backstory of Oreo Sonozaki, and also has a young Hifumi Takano. However, I cannot cover this manga as it is ongoing, sitting at the moment with only 5 chapters. So, I'm putting an addendum here on that arc since it's not done, but you can guarantee that once it is, I will be covering it on the channel. For this video in particular, we will be covering multiple arcs so we can get to the main meat of the series. The first arc we will be talking about today is one that only some diehard fans may have heard of called A Little Demon, written by Akira Kanada. This arc takes place during World War II, just like Oni, and it's a part of the larger Katari Banashi anthology series. This anthology is an official posting of fan-submitted stories, later adapted into a light novel and a manga. This will definitely not be the first time you hear me talk about Katari Banashi, so might as well get used to it. <laughs> After having just wiped out a strategy base from the Japanese, Best named American gunner Howard Loverock, gosh that's such an American name, is immediately pursued by a Japanese plane. He manages to shoot it down, but as it's going down the enemy plane rams his. He launches his parachute out, praying he'll be okay to the guardian goddess of fortune known as the Little Demon. Which in reality is just the name of his airplane, or a sticker that's on his airplane. His praying and hoping ends up paying off though, for now, because he lands on the ground. But his trade-off is that both of his legs are broken. He has no way to get into contact with his captain or squad, and to make matters even worse, he had to leave his pistol, his knife, his survival kit, and his rations all on his plane. Howard is all alone, with broken legs in enemy territory, with no food, and no means of survival. He begins to panic and worry if he'll starve to death or if the Japanese will find and kill him, or even worse, if they'll do human experimentations on him, because that was very popular during the World War II era. Tears start to come out of his eyes when his heart sinks. He hears something coming his way. He hurriedly turns over, trying to crawl away into hiding, thinking that they must have found his crashed plane and are on the hunt for the surviving pilot. A figure begins walking up behind him with black eyes when he screams and then hurts his leg and screams even louder. The figure meeps. Wait a minute. Meeps? Is this Rika? Uh, anyways, this girl, whoever she is, notices his legs are hurt and runs off to get some help. Howard starts to lose his shit because he assumes she's going to get an adult to go and kill him and torture him, but to his surprise, she brings another kid. This kid is, forgive me if I say this wrong, Tomesaburu Kimiyoshi, and then the person next to him turns out not to be Rika. This is Ruka. <laughs> oh, ah, oh, no, 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 not that one. Not that Ruka. This one, yeah, this one. This is Ruka Furude. But honestly, most of this story just feels like a clone of Rika. The two kids give him a sweet potato, and Tome uses the little English he knows to communicate between them. Tome asks if he's the pilot of the plane that crashed, and worried that if he tells them the truth, something bad might happen. So he tells them instead that he is not a pilot or a bombardier, he's a gunner. Ruka literally does not seem to believe this at all, but proceeds to act like she does. They talk a little longer, and Tomei tells Howard that they are in Hinamizawa village. Ruka tells him that he's wrong, and that this is actually Onigafuchi village. This confuses Howard, since he isn't sure what the village is really called, and the two argue about which is right. The village's name was changed during the Meiji Restoration, which was when the Tokugawa shogun lost his rule over the country, and the previous emperor reclaimed his throne in 1868. 
the people of the town refusing this name change actually makes a lot of sense since most of them are very against any kind of change to village traditions. Tomei finally backs down and agrees to tell Howard that the village is in fact called Onigafuchi, and they promise to come and bring Howard food from this point on. One of the days they visit, Ruka is in her full Miko garbs with the hoe they use in the Cotton Drifting Festival dance. Tomei plays a drum for her as Ruka performs the ceremonial dance for Howard, and Howard is in complete awe. They tell him the dance was for him, and this silly little bro starts crying after that. You know, Howard is actually a pretty decent dude. Her eyes go cold and she walks over, but instead of doing anything crazy like you might have assumed, she does a classic for a day and pets his head. Howard's response is to, uh, kiss her on the hand, which is met by a blushing Ruka that flicks his forehead. She pouts because the only one that is allowed to kiss her is her brother, although, in the translation, they say the only one that is allowed to lick her is her brother, which is a little weird, saying she'll be together with him in the afterlife. The trio talk a lot from this point on, and we learn a fair bit about Howard. Apparently, his parents are corn farmers back in America, and he played a lot of baseball as a child. The kids continue to take care of him and bring him food while his feet are healing, and they talk about the village and a little bit of its history. Ruka's brother unfortunately had very recently passed, and she had to take his place manning the shrine. She's also very nervous about not being able to do the dance correctly. One morning, Ruka and Tomei come to fetch him, saying he has to escape because soldiers are looking for him. They carry him over to a wagon, telling him not to move or talk. Something feels awfully sketchy about this. The two start to take him to the Faraday Shrine, but on their way over, Howard pees his pants since they run into other villagers. These villagers have picked up Howard's crashed plane, and have, to his horror, found the body of his captain. He begins to panic heavily after seeing his body, and they talk about how they saw two parachutes going out. They're going to go check the mountains later for the other survivors. What is very interesting is that here it says that in the bombing, Ryugu-san and Hojo-san's daughter died. So these aren't Satoko Satoshi or Rena, but they are somehow related to them, at least in this fragment. Howard starts to cry because of how terrible he feels for having bombed them when Ruka says they won't find him and delivers a Oyashira-sama prophecy. He says that the other soldier was the demon away, and that Watanagashi will happen this year. All the villagers begin to pray their thanks to Oyashira-sama, and Ruka and Tomei continue their trip to the shrine. Once arriving, they set Howard down and give him some tea. That was a drink specially made for him. You know, maybe this could be nice. As we saw in the last video, the shrine is a perfect place for outsiders to dwell, so Howard might be fine and happy here. They leave him alone for a few minutes, and he begins to relax for the first time since he crashed. He thinks that once the war is over, he'll repay the kids by taking them back to America and letting them have a big feast. Which, not gonna lie, this feast looks banger. I'm really craving some cake after seeing the way this cake looks. He notices nearby some newspaper clippings and a scrapbook, which, to his horror, realizes that the scrapbook has a photo of the plane that rammed the little demon, and the pilot was Ruka's older brother. This is when all of the pieces begin to go together in his head, with him realizing that the brother recently passing was referring to him dying in combat. To Howard. Oh no, our boy's in danger. The door behind him creaks open with a sinister smiling Ruka looking at him. He tries to crawl away, but the special drink Ruka gave him ended up knocking him out. He wakes up tied down with an audience watching him. Oreo has appeared and talks about how this is going to be their first Watanagashi in years, blaming the town's sudden decline and them not being able to do human sacrifices anymore. And uh, apparently they plan to eat him. In fact, Tomei is so excited to eat him that he's losing his shit. Turns out the dance she did for him was to purify his innards, <laughs> as silly as that might sound. In a last ditch effort to save himself, he starts begging Ruka to help and save him. Our poor boy's pleas are met instead with a knife to the shoulder, Ruka screaming that this is revenge for her brother. Howard yelps in pain, realizing that the little demon was not a guardian goddess. She was, surprise surprise, a demon. She wasn't meant to protect people, and that Ruka right in front of her is a demon as well. The last panel of the manga is him screaming at her that she is a little demon, with him presumably being killed and eaten off screen. I don't know about you guys, but I found this one to be a little bit of a disappointment. Let's break it down. I found this arc to be outdated and a little bleak. Naturally, it didn't have much time to flesh itself out or make the story stand out, but the time that it did have felt like nothing of real interest happened. I enjoyed Howard as a character because he was pretty chill and he was a kind guy, but we really didn't get to know anything meaningful about him besides some very minor details that are only mentioned once, so we didn't really have much reason to care about when he died, as terrible as that might sound. 
Ruka is a literal copy paste of Rika, just much less interesting and dialing up the cliche horror a little too much. And Tomei is, well, I don't really know. There isn't much to him at all. He's kind of boring. The writing was not very interesting and honestly a little bit predictable. You could probably tell that they were going to kill him very early on. Although I do understand that I'm being a little harsh on this one, there is good reason behind it because there are other short stories in this same catalog that are way better than this. The big question now here is though, is it canon? After a little bit of thought, I mean like a very minuscule amount of thought, I've decided very easily that this arc is not canon. Almost everything in this arc has been heavily outdated as I've already stated, or never mentioned again. In the Oni manga, the more accurate World War II story, they never referred to the town as Onigafuchi, only Hinamizawa, at least at this point, meaning that this was thrown out and probably only applicable to this story. Although it is mentioned and used sparingly in other arcs, Ruka and Tomei are characters only mentioned in the story, never again anywhere else in the entirety of Higurashi. There might be an argument to be made that Ruka is Rika's mom, but even so, there is no evidence to support that, making a lot of the story have holes in it for the rest of the timeline. So. There is no realistic way that this arc is canon. Because of that, Little Demon will not be going on the timeline. Although, I guess there is an argument to be made that since any fragment is possible in Higurashi, this could be canon to an extent. But for the purposes of this series, and for the overall sanity of most people in the community, this is not relevant at all. What do you guys think of this arc? Did you guys like it? Did you think that some parts of it were cool? Maybe you think it's canon? Maybe you disagree with me? Be sure to let me know if you liked it or felt the same way. Now this next part of the video is not sponsored, but my really great friend Ray made some super adorable Higurashi charms. They are a combination of our beloved series with Animal Crossing, and I think the end result is absolutely worth picking up. They are only $10, and currently there is a selection for Rena, Rika, Satoko, Neon, Keichi, and Shion, which I am definitely going to pick up that Keichi one when I can. I'll put her Etsy shop in the description below, so be sure to support her if you can. I am, again, no way sponsored. I just want to both help out a friend and help support artists in the community. Anyways, next up we have a very tiny one that, once again, I would be surprised if you folks had heard about called Utsusu Kuwashi Hen. I probably said that wrong, but this name is kind of ridiculous. This is a manga written by Kito N that covers a character in the cast named Shion Sonazaki's time at St. Lucia, a hell-like school responsible for a whole lot of fuck shit. Our story begins with many of the girls in our all-girls school freaking out about the body of their math teacher being found in a pool. Everyone is abuzz gossiping, trying to figure out what happened, and they start talking about who the person that might have been responsible for it was as we're introduced to her, Kozaka Mizuho, our main character. The entire classroom gasps and takes occasional glances at her while talking about how she might have been involved when the class rep comes in over to talk to her. Mizuho ignores her, and this ticks off the rep and makes her steal her notebook, sending Mizuho into a frenzy. The poor girl ends up tripping over a desk when a very familiar face in Shion Sonozaki appears, telling off the rep and giving the notebook back to Mizuho. She runs off and Shion is called to the main sister office, where Shion is mega sassy and tries to leave, but before she does, the sister asks about Mizuho. Shion replies that she seems fine, and the sister seems to be worried that Mizuho has seen something like this before. You see, when she was a young girl, as the rumors have it anyways, she was about to be killed by her grandmother because she was against the marriage of her parents. Her father was killed, but thankfully her mother lived and put her into St. Lucia to keep her away from troubling familial matters. This is likely the reason for Mizuho's strange behaviors, which I don't blame the girl at all. That sounds awful. Shion goes and tries to become friends with her later, but does a horrible job as she ends up making Mizuho cry. She ends up feeling bad but reconciles with her by saying that she understands where she's coming from as she too was almost killed by her grandmother. For those that don't know, it's in the Sonazaki tradition to kill one of the twins as they believe that one of the twins is a devil child. Shion and Mion were subjected to this but instead of killing Shion they just simply sent her away to St. Lucia. They manage to become friends though because Shion gives her an eraser that she calls her special charm, which ends up making Mizuho laugh for the first time in the series and presumably one of the first times since she has come to St. Lucia. Outside there were two people watching them that hold hands and run away skipping, who appear to be twins. Later after class, Mizuho manages to muster up the courage to ask Shion to play a game with her, and Shion happily obliges. They're confronted on their way over by the class rep. She gets 
onto her because she's fed up with her doing poorly and everyone in the class being punished for her actions. She unlashes back at her, but the rep hits her with a low blow. She tells Mizuha that the sister wanted Shion to make friends with her. This ends up obviously really hurting Mizuho, and she apologizes to Shion for troubling the class and walks away. Man, fuck this class rep, bro. She is a bitch. This is when we get introduced to the twins who seem to confuse Shion, but Mizuho goes to pray when she's randomly hugged from the back. The person tells her to be quiet, or you won't hear her song. And then a person falls from the second story of the building and dies. This person gets uncomfortably close to Mizuho and then randomly kisses her. She introduces herself and then leaves. This will be the only time we ever see her for reasons you will find out very soon. Oishi shows up on the scene of the possible crime to investigate what happened. The sister explains the deaths that have happened, to which the police say they are obviously murders, which they totally fucking are, the sisters off her rockers. She tries to say these are judgments by God, and that they have to follow the house rules here. The sister leads them to investigate the scene when Mizuho runs out to tell them about the suspicious person she saw, but because she was at the scene of both crimes, this leads to Oishi suspecting her of being the killer. This freaks Mizuho out, and she apologizes and pretends like she just didn't know anything, then leaves. The investigators try to question the sister, but she decides to not say a word. She meets up with Shion and tells her about the person she met that she believes committed the crimes. Shion, to Mizuho's surprise, believes her with no questions asked. And then Shion goes on a crazy, creepy mini tirade that's pretty typical for her. This scares Mizuho, but it's okay, because Shion promises to protect her. And from here, we will never know what happens because this manga was unfortunately cancelled. The author for it cancelled the series for what she claimed was personal reasons, but of course people speculated. Some fan theories are that it was cancelled because it was too similar to Umineko, which was also releasing at the time of the manga's publishing. Naturally though, since the story was never finished, we cannot say whether it was canon, so it is unfortunately defaulted to not canon. This is a shame because I actually was really enjoying the story for this one quite a lot, but we will never get to see where it goes from here. The final thing we will be talking about in this video is an arc that many of you should already be familiar with called Himatsubushi-hen or the Time Wasting Arc. This arc takes place five years before the events of Higurashi and focuses on Akasaka and his investigations of Hinamizawa. This arc takes place five years before majority of the events inside of Higurashi, and focuses on Akasaka and his investigations of Hinamizawa. I'm sure some of you might question why this is so early in this timeline, and the first arc from the original series we're going to cover. The reason for this is because this takes place five years prior to the main story, and it is called Chapter Zero, therefore making it the oldest fragment in the entire series. So I believe it should come next in the chronology of the series since it's just what would make the most sense, as well as it being a fitting place to set up for the next video. Himatsubushi Hen technically begins with a PlayStation 3 exclusive prologue, where the main character of this arc in this series, Akasaka Mamoru, is going to become a principal for the public security teaching unit. He didn't initially plan for this, and with this change comes the closing of the Seventh Records, which is a place that he says is a collection of all the conflicts his colleagues and him fought together, where some were able to reach the truth. I for one find this very interesting, because Ryu's group he's created is called the Seventh Expansion, and obviously his name is Ryu Kishi 7. So, this office being called the Seventh Records, with it having a collection of truths, is a neat little easter egg for us readers, for those that understand it of course. He finds one that he remembers quite vividly titled the Hinamizawa Gas Disaster, which sparked interest in him to go and rekindle with an old acquaintance of his in Hokkaido that we all know very well named, and I'm actually not sure how to pronounce his last name, but it's Oishi Kuraudu. 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 While waiting in the airport with his daughter, he recalls the events he was involved in at Hinamizawa. We're then taken back to the summer of 1978 and see a younger Akasaka in action for his work, slamming someone to the ground in a brute fashion. After this we find out that he is a very happy man as the love of his life Yuki was pregnant with their child. He could not be any more thrilled, but unfortunately he might not be able to be present for his wife's delivery as he had recently been summoned for a job. He feels awful, but to respect the wishes of her and her father, he goes to do what it was he was given in exchange for making time for Yuki after this is over. You see, the reason for his summoning in this fateful summer of 78 is due to a van kidnapping the grandson of the Minister of Construction, 
Inukai Toshiki. They tie him up and phone the minister to bribe him, which he seems to take the bait according to them. He is behind the current dam building in Hinamizawa, which all of the citizens of the town are against because that would force them to vacate their homes. Akasaka is sent from the Metropolitan Police Department to investigate the town, as they are a prime suspect of the kidnapping because of this. Akasaka departs to the Gogura Police Department, where he is given the rundown of how the protesters named the Onigafuchi Defense Alliance act, which in short is extremely violent. However, nothing they can do can be punished because the entire village is involved. They cover each other's backs so that no one gets in trouble, which along with the influence the Sonazaki family has on other towns makes it a perfect defense. From here, he travels to the Okinomiya Police Department, which resided in a town under Onigafuchi defense control. Here, he meets Oishi, and knows immediately that he will likely not like him. But regardless, they decided to head into Hinamizawa. They are met with a roadblock created by the Alliance, which quickly disperses once they see that the person in the vehicle is Oishi. Despite this being against the law normally, they claim they have roadblocks because there are garbage trucks that illegally dump in the village, which ends up being true to a degree. There is a spot full of a lot of garbage in the village, however this spot was created by them to help support their argument and to also halt construction of the dam. They drive around the town a little bit to give Akasaka a tour until they reach the Sonozaki estate, then they turn around and head back. Akasaka accidentally blows his cover with Oishi, way to go big man, but due to his slip up he's able to meet with an informant that Oishi frequents with in Hinamizawa, in exchange for money of course, and some knowledge about the village and its history, about them being human eaters and all, because you know, human eating. The next day he hopped on a bus to the town under the ruse of being a tourist, but on his ride he got very weird looks from all the locals. Even when he's dropped off by the bus they all continue to stare him down as if they know his true purpose for being there. To make his situation a little more unnerving, the bus stop was full of anti-dam propaganda and graffiti. After the bus drove away, he noticed a very familiar blue-haired girl, Rika Furude. He thought to himself that Rika was the very embodiment of him and Yuki's ideal child, although he didn't want to step near her as to either wake her up or because he felt a divine presence around her. Regardless though, she woke up. I love the manga version of her waking up because she falls forward and fucking slams her face against the ground like a stupid ass. <laughs> but in every other version, she simply just wakes up at his arrival. Our guide appears to help Akasaka see the town, and Rika decides to come with the two of them. They begin their village tour, and to Akasaka's surprise, he's in love with Hinamizawa. So much so that he found himself desiring to take his wife to the village sometime. The bunch decided to end their day by visiting the Furude Shrine, which is supposed to be the stronghold of the Onigafuchi Alliance. Upon arriving, he could really feel the presence of the dam war. There are signs posted all around the entrance to the shrine grounds, but once he climbs up, he just finds a bunch of old folks chilling and talking. Rika takes him over to her favorite spot and tells him that the plan for the dam war will soon end. He asks what she means, and she tells him that it's already been decided. At first, he dismissed her claims, but then wondered if the alliance actually had kidnapped the child of the minister and had already finished negotiating to end the dam plans. While he is mid-thought, Rika starts telling him ominously to go back to Tokyo. This alarms him because he had never once mentioned where he was from, but he becomes more alarmed with how insistent she is and her sudden change in demeanor and tone. She began to make fun of him and act as if she were possessed, and just as randomly as she started, she passed out and went back to normal. Along with her sudden behavior changes, she seemed to forget anything that happened beforehand. Later, after a very silly match of Mahjong with Oishi's informant, he leaves them to get down to business. He informs Akasaka that the three great families met and talked the night prior, and are well aware of the minister's grandson's kidnapping, making it appear very heavily as if they were involved in this act. Not only this, but they're aware he's there and who he is. In fact, Rika is aware exactly who he was before they even met, as she's shown drawing them together at the family meeting. They're letting him act freely for now, but if he starts to meddle, they will go after him. This thought to Akasaka was bone chilling, as this meant that the entire time he was there today, they knew exactly who he was. After a restless night of sleep, he wakes up the next day to a call from Oishi, where he tells Akasaka that they found the grandson's wallet and medical card in a nearby town called Takatsudo, which allegedly was mostly abandoned. They set out for it immediately, with Oishi bringing a gun with him. On their way back, we get a view of the infamous dam protests, with the villagers screaming their brains out combined with prayers to make sure that this was considered a religious protest. There was a line of riot police to keep them back from the site, but even with earplugs, they were getting hearing damaged. 
An interesting thing to note is that in the manga, Mion, or maybe Shion, is here beating the shit out of riot police officers, and Akasaka notes that this is not like the person he met previously, as he met Mion earlier that day, which could be foreshadowing for something that happens in the future. The protesters formed a horde that wouldn't let their car get by, so Oishi went out to move them. While he was doing that, Rika appeared next to their car and told Akasaka she warned him and that he was a fool as she walked away. Oishi came back to the car and informed him that Oryo probably had the wallet dropped intentionally so that the boy could be handed back to the police, meaning that the damn project had come to a halt, just like Rika had predicted. This is when Akasaka finds out that she's meant to be the reincarnation of Oyashira-sama, and that she's meant to be able to predict the future. They arrive at the desolate town, and manage to find the house thanks to accidental breadcrumbs from a visit with Dr. Ire. Oishi walked up to the house while Akasaka went towards the back, and he barged inside, heavily questioning the lone and extremely suspicious person inside. In the manga, this man in question is known to be Okanugi, of the Mountain Dogs. However, in the other adaptations, it appears to just be a regular mountain dog worker, so who knows how important this is. As Oishi walked inside, he heard fighting happening behind the house, leading him to realize that someone was fighting fighting Akasaka. Before he could act, the person in the shed tried to blind him, and during the fight, we would switch to Akasaka in hot pursuit of the kidnapper. After managing to confront him, Akasaka started getting his ass beat. After getting his skull slammed with a rock, he got an anime flashback to his wife asking him to always come home, and somehow managed to get up and let his foe know that reinforcements were coming. The kidnapper panicked at this thought and pulled out a fucking gun, oh no. Akasaka has a literal stare down with the dude that pulled one out on him, scaring him so much from him staring that he can't shoot. When Akasaka hears footsteps coming, he gets really happy thinking that Oishi has won, but it's the other kidnapper, and this one doesn't hesitate to pull the trigger. However, he doesn't kill Akasaka because the quote-unquote family said there was no need to kill. Akasaka starts acting frantic in an attempt to give Oishi an opening, which ends up working perfectly as he runs in and fucking tackles the kidnapper. Thanks to this, they acquire both guns, but both of the kidnappers end up fleeing, because they don't want to shoot him in the back for some reason. I get that, like, they say they want to jeopardize retirement or whatever, but it's just really... Well, the guys are gone, but at least we have the kid, and Akasaka passed out. He later woke up at the Eerie Clinic, where he was told that his agency had called him back to Tokyo. Oishi proved to Akasaka that he wasn't that bad of a guy, and gave him back some of the money that was used for buying their information plug. Although he realized he hadn't called his wife the day prior, so he set out to find a telephone. However, to his dismay, the phone cord to the Erie Clinic's phone had been cut, so he went to try his luck at a very infamous phone booth in this series. But once again, the cord was cut. He became incredibly unnerved with how odd this series of events was when Rika appeared with a pair of scissors. Naturally, he assumed she was the one cutting the lines, which was correct. And her response to this is that calling would make him sad. He sighed and agreed with her, and left to go back to the hospital with Rika leading him. On her way back, they stopped by the Faraday Shrine, because today is the Cotton Drifting Festival. This festival is much weaker than the normal ones, probably because a lot of people are trying to fight the dam project. They make their way to their spot they were at earlier. The two talk about how Rika was right about the dam project ceasing to move forward anymore, and Rika starts going off on a tangent about how this tranquility would be short-lived. In a year, the dam project head would be cut into pieces, and the year after that, the Hojo parents would be killed, and the next year, her own parents would be killed, and then the Hojo aunt would be killed, and finally, she would be killed. She tells him that she wants to live happily, surrounded by her friends, and that she doesn't want to die. Their time gets cut short though, and Akasaka ends up getting wasted so he doesn't end up thinking about what Rika said for too long. The next day, he was met with horrible news, that Yuki had passed away in an accident at the hospital. On days Akasaka didn't call or visit, she would go up to the rooftop to watch the sunset or to cool down, so that they could be connected under the same sky. Akasaka forgot to call the day of the kidnapping raid, and on this day she slipped on her way down, tumbling down the stairs in a freak accident resulting in her death. This was Rika's warning, to go back to Tokyo, so he would be able to stop his wife from dying. We then come back to the present day of 1985, where Akasaka and his daughter have arrived in Hokkaido. It has been seven years since the death of his wife and the birth of his daughter Miyuki, and he has frequent nightmares about what happened, showing that he feels very guilty for not having heeded Rika's warnings to go back to Tokyo. He meets up and finds himself bonding with Oishi heavily over old memories and their similar fields of work. Because of them reminiscing, he realizes that Riku was cutting the phone lines way back when to make sure he didn't find out about his wife's death sooner. He opens up to Oishi about Rika having predicted Yuki's death, 
and at first he tries to hold back laughter from this claim. Well, she asks that if she knew about Yuki's death, why didn't she know about the Great Hinamizawa disaster, which was a horrible gas eruption from Unagafuchi Swamp that wiped out the entire village. They begin to talk further about it, and he mentions to Akasaka that Rika died before the gas disaster. Rika predicted she would die on the day she ended up being killed, and predicted the exact manner she would die in. In fact, Every person she said would die, did in fact die in the way she predicted. Akasaka then realized that the reason she cut the phone cords truly was so that he would be able to hear her pleas for her wanting to live. She wanted him to save her from her fate. He felt like a fool, possibly the biggest fool in the world for not having realized this sooner. He began to break down in the visual novel for finally figuring out she was crying to him for help. Which I gotta say, phenomenal job! The music here is perfect, and Akasaka's voice actor did an amazing job showing all the distress and emotional release he's had in his body over the course of the last seven years. Oishi tries to comfort his friend by saying that if he's upset, they should work together to uncover the truth of what really has happened in Hinamizawa. They will reveal the truth to avenge all of those that fell in the village. And just like that, the time-wasting arc comes to an end. I would like to note that this is the good ending to this arc. The bad ending is that when Akasaka gets shot earlier, instead of making a distraction for Oishi, he doesn't do anything. The end result to this is them shooting him again and killing him. But anyways, let's get to the analysis, shall we? Firstly, I am normally a Dean sympathizer. I love the Higurashi anime, I think people harp on it way too much. But damn! I'm gonna harp on it a little bit here because they butchered this arc really hard. When I finished reading the manga, I came to a new understanding of this arc. Originally in my 10,000 subscriber Q&A, I rated this as the second worst arc in the series from a pure anime only perspective. But my opinion has changed about it entirely after having consumed both the visual novel and the manga. This was a beautiful story, filled with some rich characterization for Rika that was really needed in the anime that just wasn't there, and a lot of fleshing out of the village to sides that you never really got to see much of. The visual novel also naturally gives a much deeper dive into the series, and it makes you question a fair bit as well. Were the Sonazakis actually responsible for the kidnapping of the minister's grandchildren? They never fully confirm it, but they never outright deny it either. This could totally just be the mountain dogs pulling strings, or it could be a command from Oreo, but you never really know. I could see it going either way. Does Rika start every loop from the very beginning? Prior to reading the visual novel, I didn't really think that a Rika from five years in the past knew about the events of the series, but upon reading, I began to think. You see, prior to this, I had thought that Rika started every loop during the summer of 1983, taking over the mind of Rika already in that fragment. This seemed to be widely accepted in the community. Even Go affirms this because she just spawns at around this time, but the shark flips that on its head. How does Rika know about the events five years in the future? Can Rika temporarily take control of herself in certain points of the fragment? Or maybe this was just really, really early on in Rika's loops. Because we do know that Rika at the beginning had longer loops, but every death gradually made them shorter. I know this is such a small detail, but it's really got me wondering a lot, which I think is a testament to the writing of the series. When an arc should already be solved, it still makes you wonder about the intricacies. It's, at the end of the day though, just food for thought. I really do love how deeper knowledge can enhance your experience too, since you really see that at least for a while. Rika was doing everything in her power to ensure she stayed alive. This really makes you feel for her. I also really just love the way that the village is portrayed in this arc. This is the first time you really get to feel, oh shit, these fuckers are insane. Seeing them do literally anything if it means protecting the village, from super loud protests to roadblocks, to creating a literal dump to possibly even kidnapping the child of a government official is just insane. Oishi is given much more depth because previously he was a cop that sometimes randomly would just be an asshole. The visual novel helps show that he's ambiguous sometimes with his morals, and that while he does sometimes go crazy to find the truth of Hinamizawa, he also enjoys having fun, really likes women, and he also uh, took up dancing once he retired, <laughs> which is a fun little fact. I liked him before, but this made me like him a lot more. Also, the manga shows him having this crazy scar that might relate to the Sonazakis, so how crazy is that? This arc does one thing so perfectly. Akasaka. I'd be lying if I said before reading this, I did not understand the hype for him. He's literally just some dude that would show up every once in a while, and just kind of punch people. He felt shallow, unimportant, and an unnecessary addition to the story. Now, I like him a lot. His love for Yuki is adorable. His care for his job and making sure people are okay is admirable. He's apparently crazy good at Mahjong, and I would have just never known that. And the visual novel makes his appreciation for Rika make sense. 
I cannot believe how fucking awesome the visual novel was. Seriously, this was so worth a read. There was still a lot I cut out, obviously, because it's a full runtime is like 8 hours or more. But if you have the time, I seriously recommend reading it. Anyways, now it's time to ask ourselves, is it canon? This is absolutely a no-brainer. It's canon. Himatsubushi Hen is one of the four question arcs that make up the eight arcs of the original Higurashi story. There should be zero debate whether this is canon or not. So this is our first official entry after Kota Higurashi Hen on our timeline. And with that, we wrapped up everything that takes place in Higurashi prior to chapter one in the main meat of the story. Again, I will come back to Oni whenever it finishes, and it will likely go between Himatsubushi and Kota Hokushi, but for now, this about does it for stuff that happens before everything we really need to get talking about. Thank you guys so much for watching, thank you for Jim for supporting me on Patreon, I appreciate you man, and I'll see you next time when our story actually gets cracking.